Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Ron Vale from Genelia Research Campus, and I would like to welcome you to Life Science Across the Globe. Um, today, we're in our third round of talks, and we are in Europe, and very pleased to welcome our sister institute, the European Molecular Biology Lab, and uh, we can look forward to another great uh, science talk and science culture talk from them today. So um, Joe McIntyre will introduce today's speakers. Uh, Joe is Associate Director of EMBL and uh, Europe Bioinformatics Services. She and her team uh, run uh, the Euro uh, Euro European uh, PubMed Central project. And Joe has been uh, a very important and world-renowned thought leader in open science overall, but in particular with regard to literature and data mining. And I also encourage you to watch uh, Joe's previous talk in this series in her um, science culture talk where she uh, described the open science culture uh, at EMBL. And you can access her recorded talk on the website, website Life Science Across the Globe or on YouTube. So with that, I'd like to welcome Joe, who will introduce today's speakers. Hello, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to my colleagues from EMBL today. Firstly, our scientific talk will be from Jan Corbell, who is tenured principal investigator and head of data sciences at EMBL based in Heidelberg, Germany. Jan joined EMBL as a group leader in 2008 and his group's interest is in understanding determinants of genomic DNA rearrangement formation and selection, both semantically and in the germline. The lab's research is facilitated by modern methods in data science, including advanced machine learning. He has been on the steering committee of the Thousand Genomes Project and co-initiator of the ICG TCGA pan-cancer analysis of whole genomes study. Jan has received numerous awards for his research, including the Petscola Foundation EACR Cancer Researcher Award. He was elected into the German National Academy of Sciences at an unusually young age, and is an elected member of the European Molecular Biology Organization, or EMBO. Jan is also a faculty member of the new Ellis unit in Heidelberg, which has a mission, the Ellis, Ellis has a mission to promote research excellence and advance breakthroughs in AI in Europe. Um, hello everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm Jan Korbel from Embel Heidelberg, calling in from the beautiful city of Heidelberg. It's a lovely day. And uh, I say hello to everyone um, from wherever in the globe you're joining. Um, the title of my talk is Integrated Multiomic Analysis of Somatic Structure Variation by Hyaplotov Resolved Single Cell Sequencing, a bulky name. Hopefully in my 25 minutes talk, it will be clear about what I'm heading at. Um, my laboratory has uh, existed for a bit longer than a decade at the EMBL. And we've, uh, since uh, we started, had um, the main aim or mission to understand what are the determinants behind the formation and the selection of mutations in our genome that lead to genetic variation, normal genetic variation and disease. And there's broadly two types of genetic variation we can distinguish. One are small variants, uh, single letter changes in the DNA code, also known as single nucleotide variants. And the other are larger variants, genomic structure variants where sentences or chapters are missing in the code or flipped in orientation or duplicated. And um, in a typical genome, there would be more of these single uh, letter variants out there. However, structure variations altogether, although they are fewer in number, will comprise most of the sequence differences so most of the letter changes because of their size. And, and these variants have been linked to numerous diseases, whether they are occurring in our inherited genome that we um, uh, acquire from our parents and pass on to our children, or whether they occur somatically during life causing cancer. And I'd like to focus today on cancer. I know we are in a pandemic and uh, COVID-19 might be very much on your minds um, uh, for very good reasons. Uh, 
there are clearly other diseases out there and cancer is um, still one of the major killers um, uh, across the globe. Um, and uh, what I'm depicting here is uh, something that intrigued me for, for, for many years. Um, we are uh, seeing here to the left, um, the karyotype of a normal cell and to the right, the karyotype. So a, an image, a microscopy image of microscopes from a cancer cell, where there's numerous uh, differences, both numerical, so more chromosomes, and also in the structure of the chromosomes shown here. And numerous mutational processes lead to these differences. And actually fairly relevant for understanding of cancer biology, with every cancer type being different. It matters whether you're suffering from a breast tumor or from for a brain tumor, um, there will be different pathogenicities associated with it in different treatments. Um, and there's another factor um, that inspires me to engage in cancer research that actually every patient is different too, um, as is the case as we have all learned in the past months from COVID-19. Uh, some people are more susceptible towards uh, um, a more severe disease cause. That's also certainly true for cancer. And some people will relapse from cancer treatment whereas others won't, and we need to understand uh, cancer from a very personal point of view to find the right treatments. What my laboratory is interested in a very basic question, how do these structural abnormalities come about? What are the processes that form them and how are they select during the evolution of a cancer genome? And we've been studying this process for many years, and I'd like to introduce one process here, chromothripsis, which has both stunned me and excited me at the same time, uh, excited me, because it gave me a, uh, uh, a riddle that uh, we went out to solve after first observing this process in cancer cells. Chromothripsis is a process whereby whole chromosomes can shatter into numerous pieces and then get rejoined up errantly by DNA repair processes that don't function properly. And the, the outcome can look uh, like the plot below um, with a chromosome having multiple pieces that are missing, um, indicated by the stepwise pattern. So these are losses and of DNA. These, there's also gains. And these connecting lines here indicating that the DNA repair processes acting in the cell have completely scrambled this chromosome with pieces that were previously here, now being there, and, and so on. And we've, we've been studying processes such as chromothripsis by assembling a very large number of cancer genomes in a study that I co-initiated and co-led over the years also known as the Pan Cancer Project. And that fits very well to this global talk because PCOG was truly a global study with um, many continents contributing samples and also analyses. Uh, we've had 1,300 scientific and clinical participants in the project that studied 2,600 cancer genomes from 38 tumor types. And earlier this year, we published our data um, in, um, in a series of back-to-back -back papers in Nature Publishing Group. And I'd like to just very quickly uh, report to you that international data sharing was crucial for this project to actually work. Um, we um, shared data using cloud computing, using high performance computing, um, and using really modern techniques and, and big data, uh, such as containerized workflows, to allow everyone in the globe pursuing analysis to do these in exact same, same fashion so that analysis results were comparable. And then there were also many scientific results that I'll be cutting short here to tell you um, more about uh, what we are currently doing and will be doing in the future. But we found that tumors have an average four to five driver mutations, the mutations that hit crucial um, parts of the genome and, and, and uh, change them, such as oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. And we found exciting for our lab that the majority of mutations in these cancer genomes were structural variations. So point mutations more frequently studied in cancer research actually make up the minority of cancer drivers. So structural variations are important. In which context do they arise? Well, they often actually arise in complex situations and are fairly hard to decipher, which is why we need modern approaches in sequencing technology and, and uh, algorithms to, to understand their impact. I'm showing here an example from acral melanoma, a uh, malignant skin cancer that um, particularly often occurs in individuals of Asian and African ancestry. And um, the majority of acral melanomas we studied in this project had chromothripsis events. In most instances, these led to the activation of crucial 
oncogenes, cancer genes such as TURD and CCND1. And uh, when we use these genome sequencing data to, to assess the evolution of these genes, we found to our surprise that uh, chromothripsis was only not only very abundant in these melanomas, but also comprised one of the earliest mutational events that we can trace in these cells. Namely, we built a phylogeny of mutations and a temporal ordering based on the assumption that when the same site in the genome is hit, we can, uh, by reading the sequence, record which mutation was first. And we found that mutations that occur throughout life, such as UV mutations, um, UV mediated point mutations occurring from sunlight exposure occurred after chromothripsis, which makes chromothripsis potentially a crucial predisposing somatic mutation in this context. So, so far our study of cancer genomes, um, which gave us quite intriguing insights, but also carried limitations. When we study a cancer genome, we look at a product of years and sometimes decades of evolution of mutations and selection within the patient. Um, and this evolution, evolution actually can take place um, uh, outside of any diagnosis being made as often cancer is diagnosed 10, sometimes even 20 years after an initial mutation has taken place. And we'd like to understand this basic fundamental process of how mutations occur and get selected for more precisely and hence recently turned to study genomes in single cells. And uh, the motivation is here, the human body has 10 to the 13 cells and fundamental disease process, including cancer, are driven by alterations that appear in a single cell. So we have to turn to the single cell to go to the basis of cancer. But there's quite tremendous challenges with current technologies that led us to go into a different direction than the state of the art with regards to studying structure variation in cancer. Current techniques, namely a high cost and also fairly low throughput when we want to detect structure variation. Whole genome amplification is commonly used. This is a technique that's both laborious and also introducing artifacts as it leads to a polymerase introducing so-called artificial read chimera that look like SVs. So we're producing something while we're trying to measure and that confounds the measurement. What did we do? Well, we turned to a different technique, a technique that a former postdoc um, of our group, Ashley Sanders, who just moved on uh, last month to now form her own laboratory at the MVC in Berlin. She brought a technique to us um, from her PhD advisor's lab, from Peter Lansdorff's lab, called Strand Seek for strand specific sequencing. And this technique um, uses DNA replication in single cells to introduce a label that we can trace, BRDU, a nucleotide analogon that is incorporated into the nascent strand during DNA replication. And at the end of DNA replication, we hence have entire chromosomes where in each chromosomal homolog, the old strand remains DNA, whereas the new strand is BRDU substituted DNA, here shown as a dotted line. We can then, um, after cell division, isolate these chromosomes and separate the DNA strands to only sequence the old strand and hence sequence for each homolog only one strand. And gives, this gives us unique and very powerful information. Namely, what Ashley um, developed with us uh, in our group is a principle to analyze these data in three different ways and integrate these different layers of data in a principle that we termed single cell tri-channel processing because we are analyzing three layers at once. So we're looking at how many reads map into a certain interval, that's the depth of coverage, we're looking which strand these reads are from because we can distinguish two strands. You're colored in orange or green, Watson and Crick. And we can monitor the haplotype phase. Because as you see here, since each homolog is sequenced on only one strand, we can conveniently segregate all of the genomic information into its haplotypes. And haplotype from telomere to telomere, every SNP that we see. And when we integrate these three layers of information, what we found is that every class of structure variation has a single specific recognizable footprint. And this is shown, for example, for one class of structure variation here, known as an inverted duplication. An inverted duplication comes with a depth increase, with a strand imbalance, and with one DNA strand showing both haplotypes, which comes from the fact that one haplotype flipped in orientation while it was duplicated. And as you can see here, other SVs have different footprints. This is also exemplified here for a deletion, loss of information, 
uh, at the read depth level, with loss of one strand and one haplotype, and a balanced inversion where the read depth is unchanged, but one strand flips onto the other and one haplotype flips in orientation. Since every structure variation class has its own recognizable footprint, we could create for the very first time haplotypes of individual cells, uh, karyotypes of individual cells at haplotype resolution. And these are shown here. Um, these karyotypes are at 200 KB resolution, and they are uh, 3.5 times better than the current clinical standard in terms of resolution cytogenetics. They're highly accurate. Each event that we uncovered here, we were able to verify by whole genome sequencing or array-based techniques or by karyotyping. And uh, these karyotypes are um, quite considerably cheaper than when they would be um, obtained by whole genome amplification, so 54 cheaper. And we can achieve these at fairly high throughput in experiments of several hundred cells at once. Not only do um, classical simple classes of structure variation have their own footprint, also more complex patterns. Chromothripsis has its own footprint. Here's an example of a subclonal chromothriptic event with multiple deletions, duplications, invert duplications, all on the same chromosome and actually clustering on only one homolog as one would predict based on the mechanism of chromothripsis. Uh, these are present at less than a, or about a third, a bit less than a third of the cells and uh, hence would normally be uh, invisible to, to standard sequencing. However, we could um, verify them even using standard whole genome sequencing after going very deep to 160X coverage um, about uh, five times deeper than we would normally go. And then we were able to um, verify all of the breakpoints that we previously had been seen by strand-specific sequencing. So we published this work um, last year, and now I'd like to um, move on to unpublished um, work uh, to um, tell you what we're currently doing and where we would like to take this in the future. And then this also gives me time to quickly summarize what I presented to you. Using a new single cell method, we were able to uncover the karyotypes of single cells, finding actually um, much more structure variation in uh, cells at the subclonal level than current techniques suggest because the, the technique has such high resolution. And we now would like to really understand um, what these new structure variations we identify actually do and how they relate to cellular behavior, namely selection. And uh, this leads me to uh, the unpublished work where we're trying to uncover the functional consequence of DNA rearrangements in single cells. And we hypothesized um, that we can use um, strand seq data actually for two purposes. One purpose I already described to you, that is detecting structure variations. Um, the classical strand seq library uses micrococcal nuclease to generate libraries. And MNAs cuts precisely around nucleosomes, which occupy um, more than 80% of the genome. So this gives a fairly uniform profile, good for karyotyping cells. But since um, micrococcal nuclease precisely cuts around the nucleosomes, into these naked linkers, um, there's actually more information. We reasonably can use this fragmentation pattern to reconstruct the pattern of nucleosome and occupancy and infer from that cell type, cell state, and epigenome evolution, and perhaps even gene expression, given that nucleosome positioning in the genome is related to whether a gene is actively transcribed or not. So much the theory. Um, to test our hypothesis, we first um, we used data we had already generated and uh, um, reconstructed from it nucleosome positioning information. You see here a very widely used uh, lymphoblastoid cell and from ENCODE and the Thousand Genomes Project, GM12878. Here is where ENCODE um, inferred the nucleosomes to be. And you see here where StrandSeq, which is actually a fully harpless type resolve technique, as opposed to ENCODE, so we get the information independently per homolog, uh, where StrandSeq uh, thinks these nucleosomes are. And you can see that we get precisely more or less the same positions back with the additional added value of having a um, harp type resolved pattern. I should say here that to create this figure, we pooled single cell nucleosome occupancy reads per haplotype. So these are so-called pseudo bulk um, um, results. Um, StrandSeq, of course, has additional advantage that we get the information back for every cell individually, but then they are sparser. 
Um, encouraged by this, we asked the question, can we now use this information to study the consequence of structural variations in individual cells to go directly from genotype to phenotype and potentially mechanism? And we started out um, using um, in T cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, a T cell leukemia occurring in children, um, by looking for a known inversion and the consequences thereof on chromosome 14. This inversion depicted here, uh, 2.7 megabases in size, um, flips this section here in orientation, juxtaposing a gene desert or parts of a gene desert known to harbor enhancer elements near um, TLL oncogene known as TCL1A. And the result of which, this we already knew, is high overexpression of TCR1A. So the shuffling of uh, regulatory elements in its vicinity switches on the gene. And we use now our new technique to study nucleosome occupancy, abbreviated as NO, at cis regulatory elements in this region to assess the mechanism of upregulation. And what we found, lo and behold, is that only regulatory elements in the TCL1A region um, get affected by this. Actually, they uh, get depleted of nucleosomes, indicating that transcription factors can now bind. And this fact is very focal, um, um, which is interesting in the light of the fact that this alteration here is fairly gross, um, rearranging two uh, 3D um, chromatin domains, also known as topological association domains or TADs. But still, the result is very focal, and that's consistent with uh, recent results from Drosophila um, that we generate together with Eileen Furlong's lab, and also from Angie Futrell's lab in cancer, showing that large scale alterations that rearrange topological association domains have often very, very focal effects with only few genes being misexpressed. And we show here that this extends to the epigenome using a method that in the same cells measures these alterations and um, haplotype resolves the effects on the epigenome. We then went a step further asking whether we can also use this nucleosome occupancy data to measure effects more globally across the entire genome and not just insist on the haplotype where a structural alteration occurred. We first asked a different question. Since nucleosome occupancy is a predictor of gene expression, it of course differs between cell types. So we asked the question, can we use nucleosome occupancy to distinguish between cell types? Uh, by mixing um, strand seq data from different cell types, here in green are depicted lymphoblastoid cell lines um, derived from the blood, and these are epithelial cell lines um, derived from the retina. And we can see that both based on nucleosome occupancy in genes and also in known enhancers, we can highly um, uh, accurately uh, distinguish these cell types. And distinction is higher when we do a supervised classification than when an unsupervised classification where there's still some uh, misassignments. But once we, even for, for enhancers, once we do the analysis in a supervised manner, uh, we get full accuracy back. And we can, we can do a similar classification with micrococcal and an, uh, MNA sequencing data generated in single cells by Lyot. We then ask the question, does this effect that nucleosome occupancy appears to have an, an expression which translates to, to cell type differences also enables us to study gene deregulation at individual loci. This need would be very powerful because this is what structure variations do and are known to do. They are major determinants for gene expression change and cancer leading to striking um, um, deregulation of the cancer transcriptome, for instance, by, by activating oncogenes. And Huben and Young and Karen Grimes who performed the research in my lab found that indeed nucleosome occupancy carries a strong um, signal for gene expression. They um, used uh, a lymphoblastoid cell line here again and plotted nucleosome occupancy in y-axis direction along the gene body of many genes where the genes were stratified by expression status. Red means highly expressed, and gray means not expressed. And you can see that nucleosome occupancy is strikingly different between them. And we could hence develop a machine learning approach using a convolutional neural network to predict gene expression. And um, we used DEseq um, uh, in addition to uh, score differential nucleosome occupancy and predict snapshots of gene deregulation throughout the genome. And using um, the principle of um, 
leaving one chromosome out and predicting that chromosome after having performed training on the other chromosomes, we can show that we are fairly highly predictive with an area under the curve of up to 0.91. This means in practical terms, not for every gene in the genome will we get the expression correctly predicted in single cells, but collectively we can generate very informative snapshots that we can use to study the biology of the effect of structure variation. And um, I'm uh, showing you very quickly how we uh, try to apply this principle. We went to the large chromotryptis event that I already showed to you, where it was to date uh, uh, for us completely unclear um, what the effect of this chromotryptis event has been and why it was selected for clonal growth. And using our approach, we identified 14 genes being strikingly deregulated between the, cro the clone with the chromosopsis event and the other TLL cells in the same patient. And several of these genes actually cluster to the same pathway. And we looked for an upstream regulator and found that there was only one sensible regulator that led to this pathway being aberrant, and that's the MIP oncogene. MIP sits directly in the center of the chromotryptic region which by the way spans 400 genes, so we would not have guessed that MIP is the culprit, but this analysis strongly suggests that it is because genes uh, downstream of MIP are highly deregulated. And um, we went to verify uh, this finding into bulk RNA-seq data and found that indeed MIP is differ um, differentially allelically expressed in the sample with overexpression occurring on the chromotryptic haplotype and downstream targets of MIP are overexpressed, they're outlierish expressed compared to other TLLs, which is, is consistent with uh, our uh, method that we call uh, SCNOVA for single cell nucleosome occupancy and variation analysis. So this is my last slide. I presented to you novel uh, single cell techniques that allow us now to study the landscapes of structure variation in single cells highly accurately for diverse forms of structure variation, including chromosopsis events or inversions. And I also showed you a novel single cell multiomic method that used the fragmentation pattern of MNAs to identify in the very same cells the functional consequences of structure variations, allowing us now to go from structure variations in single cells to their consequences and mechanisms. And indeed, we can apply this to leukemia and, and, in, uh, and in many other settings, including cell lines and, and also uh, organoids, for example, to study the functional consequences using a technique, strand-specific sequencing that scales to hundreds or thousands of cells, providing new avenues to study cancer evolution and mechanisms of structural genome mutation. And with this, I'd like to uh, thank you um, for your attention, um, the, invest the key investigators are here shown in both, and I mentioned them throughout the talk. I didn't mention Isa and Sebastian, who, like Ashley, have moved on to become PIs. Um, uh, Isa and Sebastian um, were our workforces in the Peacock study, and then our independent, uh, independent PIs at Ambles Partnering Institute in Finland and Norway. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'd be looking forward to any discussion. Thank you, Jan. Great talk and a very interesting method to study genetic, especially structural variations at a single cell resolution. All right, and now time for questions and discussions. So my first question to you is referring to the part where you adapt this technique to study the epigenetic landscape, you know, the nucleosome occupancy. So my question to you is, how does this technique compare to single nuclei uh, single nuclei ataxic? Yeah, it's, um, this is a, a, a good question. And it's actually, it's actually intriguing. Nucleosome occupancy measurement by MNA-seq gives you almost the inverted signal to ataxic. So ataxic focuses on uh, and enriches very strongly on uh, regions of chromatin accessibility. So ataxic will give you focal reads at regions that are um, depleted, completely depleted of, of nucleosomes and hence accessible. Um, MNAs seq actually gives you signals for regions that are covered by nucleosomes, but cuts into the naked linkers between chromosomes very precisely. So in principle, um, the technique MNA seq is very suitable for, for what we're trying to do because it gives us a very uniform picture of um, across the genome and in, enabling us to study structure variations with this, while at the same time also letting us infer where regions of accessibility occur. 
I hope that's clear. Yeah. So attack seek again, attack seek is really powerful because it enriches for um, accessible chromatin, but it doesn't give the same uniformity as MNA seek. So for all purposes, MNA seek is actually better. Agreed. It's uniform and yeah. all right. Uh, and now question for, from the audience. Uh, our first question is from Sandhya Bhatia. Would you like to ask your question, Sandhya? Uh, you have the permission to talk. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, Sandhya, are you here? All right, I'll ask you a question. Uh, Sandhya would like to know how much heterogeneity is there in the karyotype of healthy individuals? Yeah, that's a, this is a great question and a mystery um, as, as we don't really um, know this, uh, but uh, I like what Sandhya asked and actually for us, one of the main reasons for developing the te technique that I just presented to you was to apply it eventually uh, to study exactly that. Um, um, we're currently applying it to cancer. That's for us the low hanging fruit. And we are um, making the technique as we're doing so more powerful, but then want to apply it in a normal karyotypic setting as I think that's one of the big outstanding questions. We've, we've learned over the past few years that, um, that there's lots of somatic heterogeneity in, in each and every one of us. We keep acquiring mutations, but techniques that have uh, looked for such heterogeneity we're heavily biased towards um, point mutations. And with this technique, I think we can address this in the future. Mm -hmm. At least for tissues with dividing cells, I should say, because our technique requires dividing cells. Great. But many thank tissues you. do divide, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Murali. Murali, would you like to ask your question? Please unmute yourself. Uh, all right, I'll go ahead and ask the question. So, um, Murali would like to know, can chromotrypsis um, affect just one or few chromosomes or does it always affect the whole genome? Yeah, so it's actually a good question. Uh, this is a good question and there might have been a confusion from, from how I presented this or misunderstanding. So typically it affects a single or few chromosomes, not the whole genome. Um, if the whole genome would be affected, it would be hard to uh, uh, conceive how a viable cell should result from this. I mean, even, even with a single chromosome affected, it's hard to conceive, but, but I think the way this works is that chromosomes affects typically one haplotype. So one chromosome five and the other chromosome five remains wild type. And that, that's how the cell makes it over this catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Great, that makes sense. All right, our next question is from Bruce Stillman. Bruce, uh, could you please unmute yourself and ask a question? Great talk, thanks very much. Um, ads in DNA replication timing uh, correlates almost perfectly. Um, does this influence how you interpret the BRDU labeling and assign assignments of haplotype? This is a very relevant question. And indeed we see, um, indeed we do um, see this in the data sometimes. So if, if for instance, um, so ba basically in, in, in strength experiments we pulse BRDU. And if we are lucky enough to pulse BRDU before replication has started and BRDU has penetrated the cell, then we'll get um, full absorption of BRDU into the nascent strand. However, if we're unlucky and replication has already been initiated, BRDU penetrates the system, then we'll get an overabundance of late replicating regions, which I guess is what you're heading at. Um, so we, we, can, we can sort out those cells after having sequenced them. And typically there are few, um, at least in the systems that we've studied so far. Um, we do not synchronize, synchronize the cells, um, I should say though. So it's purely stochastic. And um, it's interesting to speculate actually that the data on replication timings inherently in strategic libraries. Uh, we, we happen to be able to recognize those artifacts and sort them out. But you can of course also argue maybe they're not artifacts but useful for biology. Um, which, which, and I guess they are if one studies them this way. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you, uh, Jan. Uh, our next question is from uh, our guest, Sonam Bhatia. Sonam, uh, would you like to ask your question? Um, sure. Uh, thank you. Very great talk. Thanks for that. Uh, I was just wondering uh, if you find that uh, in your data that the structural variations actually happen at like 
similar regions in the genome? And then can you also use this to describe sort of the genomic epigenomic properties at the boundaries, not so much what genes you're selecting, but like, are they cutting or is the very... So something was breaking off. I hope I was not breaking off. Can uh, I be heard? No, you're, you're clear. I'll complete the question. So one of the question is, do you find that uh, structural variations happen at specific repeatable regions between samples? And if so, could you use this method to describe the genomic epigenomic properties of the structural variation boundaries? Yes, um, very sensible question. Actually, we do have um, um, a few examples of this, um, probably um, examples that have to do with different inherent properties of the region. So we do see accumulation in some samples of structural variation at fragile sites where there's quite some heterogeneity in single cells, but the same region um, emitting uh, de novo uh, structural variations, which are then accumulating in, in subset of these cells. We also see evidence of um, um, of convergent evolution, where we don't think a fragile site is actually responsible, but selection. Um, again, um, if one goes very deeply into cells, one sees spectacular things. So selection is really um, um, a property that's fairly prevalent in cancer patients. And we, we, we can, in principle, study the epigenetic properties of these regions. Um, the, the two examples I just described, we haven't worked out epigenetically yet, but that's, that's with this technique, is actually possible. Great. Um, so probably the last question for the session. Um, yeah, um, so single cell RNA-seq is a very powerful technique, but can also be noisy. So could you please speak to the sensitivity of this assay? And also I'm curious as to what depth do you require to sequence to get the rich information that you're looking for? Yes, so we typically aim for up to a million reads, but we're happy with, um, with libraries um, where we have um, uh, half a million or even slightly less um, reads. And I think the average is probably closer to half a million than to a million. Uh, this is much higher depth than one that gets in single cell RNA sequencing experiments. Um, but of course, we have a different purpose. We want to um, tile the genome with reads to, to reconstruct karyotypes here. Um, in terms of if, if your question was, was heading at um, how does our inference of gene expression, the snapshots of gene expression that are described based on nucleosome occupancy compared to single cell RNA-seq, uh, we still need to do that. Actually, we've done the experiment, but um, there have been some delays because of, because, uh, of, uh, of COVID-19. And uh, um, we have even received data, but the data was only partial. We are repeating them right now. I can only say that what we see with nucleosome occupancy data can be um, broadly replicated in single cell RNA-seq, but I don't have enough data yet to tell you really what the sensitivities are and, and how good we're predicting. We need, we need more and better quality data for this. All right, thank you. Uh, once again, great talk and a very interesting discussion session. Uh, with that, we move on to our next speaker for the day, 